Welcome to Not So Classy. Today is the twentieth episode of my show. Didn't think we'd make it this far, but we did. And today is. Also, a special episode because it's my birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Asna! Yay! There's no one else in the room <laughs> except for Albert Antonio. <laughs> uh, so yes, as you can see, I am back with a solo episode as Asna, the singer, and uh, I felt like I should address uh, the most common topic that comes up when people come on my show, and that's. Esna, how have you been single for 12 years? <laughs> and uh, I'm a, I'll, I'll explain that to you guys today. Um, I think if you watch my 10th episode where I celebrated my six-year debut anniversary, I go through the history of like my childhood all the way through meeting my first love and then coming out to Korea to start my career. And the only part that I didn't talk about is how we broke up and why we broke up. And how long it took me to get over him, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, my ex boyfriend and I—the only ex boyfriend that I have—we broke up when we graduated college. Uh, maybe about a half a year after that, uh, because we were going very separate ways in our life. He was moving to Japan, and I. wasn't sure what I was going to be doing, but I knew that I would be in the entertainment industry, no matter what happened. And he was in finance. And so for him, his personality is very cause and effect. You work this many hours, you make this much money, a lot of money. <laughs> but as an artist, you can be working days and days and days on end and not even get paid sometimes. And so I think we both knew that our life path was very different. And That was why we came to a decision together that it had to end, and so that's why it made it difficult for me to get over this. Because not only was he my first love, but it was because of circumstantial reasons, and not because we fell out of love with each other, or like we got in this fight and like we just hated each other. And so I distinctly remember uh, towards the end of the relationship. Both of us knew we had to have this conversation, but we just didn't know how because it was painful. Like we didn't want to necessarily break up with one another, but it was something we knew that we had to do. So we would kind of avoid it, but there was always this kind of weird, awkward tension because we knew it needed to happen. And one day, we were just randomly eating dinner at KTP, which is Koreatown Plaza in um, LA, at the food courts. We were just eating, and. It just all of a sudden happened. Had this conversation. We're like, so you know, I'm leaving for Japan in like a few weeks. What do you think is going to happen? And we just all of a sudden had this conversation. And I remember, you know, both of us being like, I think we don't know where our future is going, and it wouldn't be fair to hold on to each other when we're going to be so far apart again. Meaning, when I first started dating him. It was long distance. I was in LA, going to UCLA at the time, and he was studying abroad for a year in Japan. And so, my first relationship and the first year of that relationship was long distance, like at the ends of the world. But the reason why we got through that was because we knew he was coming back to UCLA to finish the rest of his school years, and we would be together again. And there was a definite return. But when we were graduating, this was not definite. And now this is like the real world, and we really didn't know what was going to happen. So I remember both of us just kind of silently crying <laughs> at the food court <laughs> at Koreatown Plaza. Um, but since then, we knew we had to slowly phase each other out. I don't even know how that how you would say that. And uh, yeah, that was basically how we broke up. And then I remember we had this one last big dinner for him to say goodbye. He had sold his car, and I didn't have that car that day. So my friends were taking me home, and his friends were taking me or him home. And so, the last time that we saw each other was at this restaurant in Koreatown, and and then we drove off in separate cars, and that was the last I ever saw him. Um, 
And it was weird, Bill, because even after we broke up, we were still in touch with one another, like whether it be through email, because back then we didn't really have FaceTime or like, you know, instant like messaging um, apps that can just connect you right away. It was hard. You had to use a webcam and like schedule time because you had to be in front of your computer. (laughs) Like I'm totally aging myself, but that's okay. Uh, Yeah. So even after we broke up, we were kind of talking to one another while he was in Japan and I was in LA. And then I ended up being in Korea in 2008 for a very short period of time just to teach English because I had been in LA all my life and I just wanted to experience something new, something different, but not like a complete change. And it was hard for me because when I was at home, all the places that I was going to, I was still going to UCLA during the summer and things like that because I was still on the dance team. Every time I go on campus, memories like of all the places we were at. My home, he would come home every weekend and spend time with our family. So it was just a constant, constant reminder. And it wasn't fair that I couldn't get over it or stop thinking about it because I was just completely immersed in our memories all the time. So I decided to go to Korea to teach English and nothing else, just because I wanted to live somewhere else and make some money. And I remember... The first three months living in Korea was total hell. (laughs) Like, man, that assimilation period, that adjustment period was horrible. And you would think it would be okay because I grew up in a Korean household, speaking Korean, eating our food, knowing our language, knowing our culture. But when I moved here, I was not used to seeing Korean faces everywhere I went. You know what I mean? Like... Because even in America, the most interaction with Korean people I had were on the weekends, on my weekend activities. During the the weekday, it was a very diverse environment that I grew up in, primarily not Korean or not even Asian. So that was really hard. Um, And then just people's attitudes, people's personalities here, like it's just everything about it was so, so, so hard to adjust to. So the first three months, like I was hating it here. And then... uh, the academy, English academy that I was teaching at, it was a good group of people that I actually still keep in touch with today. Uh, They're the ones that took me to an English speaking church in Korea. And that's when I made my first like batch of friends in 2008. And I was really loving it. I was starting to really love being here. Um, But there was something that happened three months in I can't really remember exactly what it was, but I had this gut feeling I should go back to the States. And so I was supposed to be here for a year, but I cut my contract short and I left half a year into it. So I had to pay like a penalty, didn't get my pension. Like it cost me a lot to actually, you know, end the contract early and leave. Uh, But I did and I had to be home. I think there were some family things that I had to be there for. And if I hadn't been there, it would have been a much bigger issue. So I was thankful that I went back. And then in 2009 is when I started doing YouTube. And first I started putting up covers and then I started doing like different renditions. And then I figured out that I can write music on my own. And so the first song that I ever wrote in its entirety is this song called You Fool. And I never publicly released it or officially released it, but I I put it up on YouTube and I performed it a few times in LA and like, and I feel like maybe even in China when I did like a tour and it's, you, I don't know if you guys, there's a piano in front of me today. <laughs> I'm really nervous because I haven't performed live music like this without an MR, but like literally playing my own music in really, really, really long time. Like it's been years since I've done that. I upload little clips and stuff like that on Instagram once in a while on my stories, but like a full on performance I have not done in a while. Uh, But this song, You Fool, is the first song that I ever wrote in my life from beginning to end. And uh, I don't know why I never released it officially, Um, but hopefully more of you will be able to 
enjoy it now that I'm performing it today. I'm like really nervous. I s w e a n j a n h a g a l k a t a k a m a m o i s k a I'm going to drink some. Okay. <laughs> This is actually something that I do. Like, uh, I think two years ago at KCON, <laughs> there was a performance and there was like a bar. So I just took a glass of whiskey with me on stage and it was pretty funny. But this is the b a l v i n i that Jen Neo brought. So thank you, Jen. All right. Cheers. All right. <sighs> This song. <laughs> God, I haven't done this in so long. It's weird. It's so weird. So this song is about um, when you're in a relationship with someone, you make a lot of promises and you say a lot of things to one another, not knowing if that relationship is going to last forever. And in the end, when it doesn't, it's painful. <laughs> Just before our time together ended, you said You would love me forever You fool, why did you ever tell me that? You said you would never leave my side You said, you said you would never let me go You fool, why did you ever tell me that? me looking for your hand whenever I'm feeling lost. Now you got me crying on my bed, wishing you were here. You got me tugging at my heart, trying to rip the pain away. You got me wondering if I'll ever, ever, ever love again. You foolish man of empty words. My heart I painted pictures trusting all the words you ever said to me Drawing all the little fine details too You fool Why did you have to look so perfect? I care too much, too deep I fell Two hearts again we are Not looking for reasons to look away You fool Take back That is a song called You Fool. Wow. I haven't sung playing like this in so... <laughs> I'm getting so nervous. <sighs> I always really get nervous after I sing. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Okay. Well, that's a song called You Fool. Uh, so I wrote that in 2009. And it's the first song that I ever wrote in my life. And it's very personal. And I think it's a good song. And maybe if enough people like it, maybe I'll officially release it. I don't know. Up to you guys. Uh, uh, so yeah, I moved to Korea in 2010. And I end up, you know, meeting people through the original batch of friends that I made in 2008. Now, this time when I come to Korea, it was like, you know, the gut feeling was like, just go and pursue your dreams. And so I follow that and I came and you can hear a little bit more about the details of that if you watch my 10th episode. And uh, today I'm just going to talk about the first three years because that's when it was fucking hell for me. And I mean, I was already... 
assimilated because I had lived here for six months before. But because my purpose for coming to Korea this time was so different, I found myself a little depressed. And uh, I remember just not being able to unpack my suitcase for a year. And that took a huge like mental stress on me because I just did not have stability when it came to my living situation. And a year and a half into living in Korea was when I randomly ended up doing the show Superstar K, which we talked very briefly about in my first episode with John Park. And I remember this is when I was living in a space half the size of this tiny studio. And there were no windows to the outside. So there was no ventilation. And that's where I developed PM, which is like the nasal congestion like thing. So I have a hard time breathing sometimes. And that's when I went to go compete at Superstar K. So you can only imagine like I was not mentally stable. Like I honestly wasn't sure why the fuck I was there because <laughs> I, I knew it was rigged anyway. So, <laughs> so then um, I made it to the Super Week and we were there for like five days and like stressed the fuck out, made it to top. 24, which was the cut right before top 12 that go to the live uh, TV episodes. Um, and I came back and even though I didn't really care for it and I was glad that I got cut, like, you know, you still kind of get down because you're like, oh, I wish I just made it. And like, it would have been made everything so much easier if I was just on TV, got the exposure or whatnot. And so I was feeling like shit. And I really needed to talk to someone and not people that knew me as Esna but people who knew me as Esther, like as, as a person that was not this performer, but just really knew who I was. And I just got this urge to talk to my ex because he really knew who I was and he really understood me. So I emailed him. Mind you, I haven't talked to him in three years. And uh, I email him and he's nice enough to respond and say, hey, I'll give you a call. Let's match up the times. And so he calls and it was the strangest feeling because his voice was the same and it was so familiar and I was so happy to hear it. But at the same time, something was different, you know, because I'm a different person now and he's a different person too. So there were familiar things, but we knew that just we had grown up. We've become more mature. We've become different people. And we would have conversations and we would bring up our old memories. And like, we'd talk about those things and I would feel really sweet. And then I would tell him the things that I was going through now and he would know how to comfort me. And towards the end of the conversation, I knew he was dating someone right after me. And so I asked him like, hey, are you still dating that girl? And he was like, oh, actually we're engaged. And so that emotion was like, Something I still to this day cannot explain because I was so, so, so happy for him because I know he deserved to be so happy. And I wish that for him. And I was so glad that he found it. But I was so devastated because I, it was like my first love is not going to be my last love. And that was something that I really like dreamt about, you know, and I always maybe in the back of my head somewhere I thought, we can try again and like make this work again when we're older and we're mature. But when I heard straight from his voice telling me he was engaged, wow, that was, that was really just heartbreaking. But at the same time, I was, it was like, uh, something had just been lifted off. Like I, it was, I could confirm to myself, you know, this is not going to happen. So you need to let this go finally, like three and a half years later. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, after that conversation, I think I was pretty numb. I didn't I didn't know how I was supposed to physically respond to that information. And so for a few days, it was just like blank face, you know, just going about my day. Because still, I'm in survival mode. So I have other shit that I actually really need to be thinking about. And then a few days later, I'm sitting in the tiny ass room, which I was living in with someone else, with a friend. Yeah. Uh, I just started crying. Like it was just like tears just streaming down. And then I, I think it finally hit me that, oh, he's not, he can never be in a, 
your love anymore. And I think that was when it was like, whew, everything was released. And I just really got over the fact that this is over and it's never going to happen again. And so that was kind of a very defining moment for me to finally get over my first love. And that took three and a half years. <laughs> the amount of time that we dated, that's how long it took for me to get over him. <laughs> and maybe about a year later, I'm on Facebook and you know, you fall down a rabbit hole, right? You go to your friend's page, you just like browse and then like it leads to another friend's page, like blah, blah, blah. And it keeps going. And then I land on this one friend's Facebook profile and his cover photo is of him being a groomsman at his wedding. And so I was like, oh, he got married. <laughs> so that was another like, oh crap, you know? And um, so then I, I ended up writing a song about that whole experience. Uh, and it's in my first mini album. It's called Oppa Pogo Shipoyo. Oppa, I miss you, or I want to see you. Um, and it's a very honest, very descriptive uh, song about how sometimes randomly I just would want to see him. I would miss him, not because I want to be with him, but I just wonder how he's doing uh, because he was such a big part of my life. And um, I don't know, may, people may have different opinions about this, but I feel like your first love will always have some kind of place in your heart um, that you will always cherish. And that's kind of, you know, where he is for me. And so after all of that happened, I was like, I really don't need to be <laughs> involved with guys. Like I'm over guys for a little bit and I was still struggling so hard trying to get my career going. Like I just didn't have the time or the mind space to have thoughts about guys and relationships. Um, and so that was two, three years into living in Korea. So that's what five years of being, being single. <laughs> like I'm like justifying all the years <laughs> that I have been single. Um, and so five years in, I debut in 2014. And so now I'm super busy with just like having to, you know, work and I'm happy about that. I'm like, I'm going places. And, you know, that was like two and a half years. And um, it was good to be busy with work, but there was always a part of me that I always wanted to be in a relationship and find someone that I could spend the rest of my life with. And after about two and a half, three years, I left my company. And the reason why I left is also in my 10th episode. You can go back and watch. <laughs> and um, after that, I was like, okay, maybe I'll be open to the idea of just casually, at least casually dating so that I can just get out there and meet people. But when I did that, I kept meeting like the sleaziest guys, just the most untrustworthy, just dirty man whores. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't know what it is. I think, I think it's partially because I realized that I have a savior complex where if I meet a guy and I know he's not the best and he has you know, areas in his life that he needs work. Like I can, I want to help make this man better, you know, but it's not my duty and it's not really my responsibility. And so I keep running, you know, into guys that are these kind of men and that are obviously just not good for me. And it sucks, but uh, I do have a level of standard that I hold up men to, which is the standard that my ex left for me, you know, he left that pretty up, up there. Like it's really high. And I know the next person or the last person that I end up with in this earth is someone's going to be better than that. It's going to be at least as good as him or better than that. And some people, you know, advise like, you know, that shouldn't even matter because you can make or break a man. Like a good woman can make a man and make him great and he can become the standard that you want, you know, but I just haven't found that. So um, I don't really know what to think of it or what to make of it, but that standard is there. And when people ask me, my Isang Young or my type is just a man that I can respect. And it's hard for me to find men that I can really just respect. Um, also in a romantic manner, you know, and I think that word, being able to respect someone, it holds a lot of weight. It explains, I think, very clearly on what kind of man I am looking for. Because, you know, 
oh, I'm 33 now. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, mid 30s, you're not playing around anymore. Like I've I've done that when I was younger, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah, and then that's what, seven, eight, nine years into it, whatever. And then and then I just didn't want anything to do with guys again because I just kept running into all these assholes and getting hurt and getting hurt. So I've just started building like this huge wall and like it's just, it was completely closed. And then last year I got in the accident where I got hit by a car. I don't know if I've ever went into detail about that, uh, but I got hit by a car walking on a crosswalk. And so I broke my collarbone. I hit my head, had a concussion and I'm still going through rehab and it will be two years in March of next year. So it's been like a year and a half already. And I'm still paying for the injuries that, you know, I had in that accident. So I didn't have any mental space to be thinking about guys because I was physically hurt. And then that made me just mentally just unstable, I guess. And that made me not leave the house because I was bedridden and I was like, I could only be at home because I couldn't move around. Um, I had, you can't, there's no brace for your collarbone. You just have to sit still and just wait for it to piece itself back together. And so that was a very difficult time uh, for me. And then I met the douchiest, worst man the worst type of human being, I don't even want to call him a man, in the world <laughs> at the end of last year. Actually, it's it was right around my birthday. So it kind of, it's triggering me. <laughs> oh man, just, I think if, if I turn this into a movie, the experience that I had with this guy, it would be a fucking blockbuster hit. And I think I'm going to try to find a writer and write a screenplay and like, fucking make a movie out of it but uh those details maybe i talk about later on another as no special episode you have to stick around to the 30th (laughs) to see this again (laughs) um but yeah so now at this point in time i am again very closed off because i got really hurt by what happened i got really angry. I put people on blast and I never put people on blast. People have known me since I was like a teenager. They know they've, they've never seen me put people on blast like that ever. And so, and they deserved it. And so I, I felt like it had to be done and I did it. And I am confident in saying that a lot of our friends are not friends with that guy anymore. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, I was, I briefly talked about it in the process of explaining to you why I'm single. I hope that does it for you guys. That's basically why I'm single. <laughs> I've, I've gone through the history of the past 12 years of why I'm single. Uh, but I briefly talked about uh, being depressed and how I think in different low points of my life, like that came back. And the first time that I actually really felt this like darkness and this depression was in high school. And it was a time when our family was just not doing well at all. And my family and I, we, we don't really have a lot of normal conversations and I never grew up like that. I never grew up super close to my parents. I never had a relationship with my brother, my brother, (laughs) my brother in a uh, I guess positive way for a while. And because I was so independent and like, I just, it was a lot of just shit going on. And it was easy for me to compute physical pain because I have a high threshold for that. And I can, I can withstand that. But the like emotional and mental, um, just being distraught, you know, and like not knowing how to deal with it and like not, and because I think unless you've really gone through it, you you can't really understand it. But I'm, I think people who are watching who have gone through depression will agree with me that it's, it's something that you can't really describe. And it's not just being sad and it's not being angry. Um, 
it's it's just uh, there's this kind of hole and no matter how happy you want to feel or you are there's something in the back of your gut or like back of your mind that just this empty feeling and you just can't ever shake it off and for me it was easier for me to deal with that physically and so in high school was when it was the first time that I had ever uh started cutting myself and it wasn't it wasn't you know it never got my depression never got so serious that I needed help out from an outside source and like I needed to go to therapy or I needed to get treated you know like it never I I feel like I want to say I had somewhat of a hold that I was able to kind of pull myself out of certain situations um but yeah, I I went through that and I remember I would be taking piano lessons and so I went and you know I would always have like my sleeve kind of half on my hands and you always get in trouble when your sleeves are like that and so I had to pull it back once and the teacher saw, you know, the scars on my wrist and you know, I don't think she knew how to respond to that but she was like, "Are you okay? Like what's going on? Like are you okay?" and you know, I just kind of brushed it off. It's like, oh, I fell like on my arm. Like, don't worry about it. You know, it's not your problem. Don't worry about it. And like, I kind of let it, let that one, you know, slide like that. And there was another time which was at school. Uh, I was with my friends. And again, you know, I had like long sleeves, but he like put his hands up and I was like, oh, hey, like, you know, and then I gave him a high five and like the sleeve went down and he saw my wrist and he was like, what is, what is that? Like, what's, what did you do? Like, are you, do you need help? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. Like it was a cat. (laughs) And then we went to gospel choir class and I, you know, he had told one of our teachers. So then I got called by the counselor in the middle of class and I went and, you know, she was like, you know, it, this is a safe place. You can talk to me. But I was like, I don't really know you. Like, I wouldn't want to talk to you about it, you know? Um, but I felt like I still had a grasp and I, I wasn't completely letting go. I just, it was like just a way for me to cope. And so when she asked me, I literally was like, by that time, a lot of it was gone. It was just like a few scabs left. And so I was like, literally just a cat scratched me. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and, you know, it, I was able to, you know, get away with that. And he was, I remember her asking me, like, should we call your parents? I was like, please don't call my parents. Like, you're just going to cause way more trouble than what it is if you call my parents. And so she ended up not. And, you know, I, I got, I got over it. I was able to somehow find ways to pull me out of that and not physically harm myself anymore. Um, I mean, so there are times when I will still feel like depression here and there because it, like I said, it's just this weird feeling in the back of your head, in the back of your gut, like in your stomach, like in, it's just there, it lingers. Um, and so even to this day, sometimes when I'm out like with, you know, so many friends at like whatever, um, I would still feel sometimes like just this, I guess maybe like a gloominess. Um, but it's, I, it's never, it hasn't gotten to a point where I physically have to do something about it in a very long time. Um, but that, t- that time in 2008, when I first moved to Korea, that those first three months when I was like, it was fucking hell for me. Um, there was a moment where I felt, I, I ca- went back to that bad habit and I was like, wait, like this is, I can't, I should not do this anymore. Got to pull myself together. Let's get, let's get through this. And then that's when the, the teachers, fellow teachers at the school, like took me to church and I made really good friends. And there was just like a good positive vibe that was around me um, that helped me deal with that. And so ever since then, honestly, I haven't, thank God that I had, that I never felt like I had to go to those measures to like relieve my emotional or psychological pain, even though I've gone through some like deep shit (laughs) in Korea that would make sense in a way, but I was able to, you know, not think about it in that way. So I feel like I'm much better. Um, So yeah, it's, it's common, I think, for a lot of us to feel this kind of depression. And I just want to let everyone know that, you know, if you really do surround yourself with good people who really genuinely care about you, there is hope 
there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we can we can do better for ourselves because we do uh, deserve better for ourselves. And that was the deepest talk I've ever had on my show. Ah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, all right. So to bring it back to a, a lighter conversation. I posted on my Instagram, uh, ask me anything. And I told you guys that I would answer them live in this video. So I'm going to go through some of them. And hopefully I can answer all of them, you know, <laughs> but we'll see. So this is the AMA session for Esna, the singer. <laughs> all right. So uh, here we go. I don't know how to pronounce any of your Instagram handle <laughs> names, but Hesse Liz, H-E-C-Y-L-I-Z said, if you were a sandwich, which sandwich would you be and why? <laughs> a sandwich? Um, let's see. Damn, that's a hard one because I really do enjoy a good sandwich. Um, I would want to be an Italian club sandwich. And the reason is because you get so many different things. You get like three or four different types of meat, like two or three different kinds of cheeses, all the different vegetables, and then like your sauce, you know? And I think I am someone that can offer a lot of different things and entertainment in a lot of different ways. And so I'm like, you know, I'm a multi-talented entertainer. And so that sandwich is multi-talented and multi-ingrediented. <laughs> so maybe I'll be like Italian sandwich. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, and the same person asked any words for those unsure of their future or feeling too old to start their music career. You know, I don't think it's ever too old because you watch shows like America's Got Talent where like, uh, Miss, what's his name? Oh, the... Oh, Susan Boyles, first of all, she started her career like in her late 40s and like she blew up, you know, so you never, I don't think you're ever too late to pursue your dreams if that's going to make you happy. All right. Uh, N-J-E-R-W-O. -J -E uh, I want to start songwriting, but I can't use the piano. I'm 23. Is it too late? I do know basic music theory. Well, there you go. You know basic music theory. If you know how to make as E chord, then you know, <laughs> then you, you can start making music. And no, 23 is not too late. You can, you can learn anything. I think you can learn anything at any stage, at any age in your life. You're always teachable and learnable. You, you're very learnable. And uh, same person asks, are you really on good terms with Mamamoo members? Like, do you keep in touch? We haven't kept in touch in about a year, actually, since last year when I saw them at KCON was the last time that we really talked to each other. And uh, I haven't really seen them since then. And September 5th, 915. The name of your favorite bar slash club. Love your podcast. Thank you. Uh, name of my favorite bar. I don't really have a favorite bar because I don't really go out. Uh, but I do really enjoy smoking shisha. And my friend has a shisha bar in Korea called Boba Bear. And I'm there like every other day. All right. Augusta Lina. When is your next song coming out or when are you going to do another drama OST song? Girl, I wish I knew. I want to. I have so many songs that I want to put out there. It's just, it's really hard. You need a lot of money. <laughs> and not having a company doesn't help. Uh, especially when you're in Korea. So I'm trying to figure that stuff out. But once I do, I'm going to be putting out some music. You can count on it. All right. And they say, Ray, biggest personal and personal regret in the last 10 years. So the whole time that I was in Korea, the biggest regret. The biggest regret? Uh, I mean, it's not a regret, but I wish things could have been different was, you know, when I was forcefully you know, I had to forcefully give away my songs. That, I wish that didn't happen. Um, I feel like if I could have kept promoting and doing the right thing, I might be somewhere different right now. So yeah, giving other people songs when I actually wanted to sing them, shouldn't have done that. 
<laughs> All right. Wafael Minari. We love you from Morocco. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Have you ever been to Morocco? I haven't, but I really want to go because I love Moroccan food. And there is a sandwich shop in Itaewon, Hebangchon, called Casablanca, where they serve Moroccan sandwiches. And it's like my guilty pleasure. I'll go there and eat Moroccan sandwiches whenever I can. And Sam, you are so beautiful and talented. Thank you. Very awkward reading that so <laughs> uh, Patty YZ underscore Zacharias. What's your favorite Mexican dish? Oh, that's really hard because I love Mexican food. Um, but I do just love like a good burrito with like all meat burrito with the cilantro and the onions and a super hot sauce. Um, I'm not too big on like the rice or the beans though, because I'm like, just fill it up with meat. Just give me all the meat. Uh, next one. Bin K. Not a question. Just wanted to say you're incredibly talented and beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all okay. Okay. All okay. All right. Mad head love. <laughs> if you got the opportunity to sign under a big label in USA, would you do it? Would you prefer one in Korea? I would definitely want to sign with a big label in America. Um, but at the same time, it depends on my status, right? Because these big labels, they have hundreds and hundreds of artists. And if they're not going to really focus on me, I'd rather go to a smaller label that I believe that can do a good job and put their all in on me. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a smarter way to answer that question. Anna Teresa, so that's my girl. How you doing, Anna? Uh, what's the craziest walk of shame story? Bitch, <laughs> trying to put me on blast. <laughs> Oh, uh, I think it was towards the beginning of my stay about 10, 11 years ago. And uh, I had to walk out of a motel. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think this person wrote to me before. No, the they as head. Are you ever going to move back to the US? I would, I would love to. I would actually love being based in Korea and in America so that I could go back and forth as much as I wanted and have work both in America and in Korea. That would like be the most ideal thing. So yes, I do want to move back to the States at one point. From the soul, would you ever go on a date with a fan? Do I have fans? <laughs> um, maybe as like an event. I don't know. No one's ever like slid into my DM and be like, hey, you want to go on a date with me? And like seriousness, I don't think that's ever happened, but maybe like on a, I don't know, maybe on like a, in like for like an event or something. Yes. Raw Fat Life. Hello, Lara. Lara was my college roommate and she was there throughout the whole first love experience. So she knows all the dirt. Uh, are you coming back to America anytime soon? And can we hang out? Yes. If this freaking pandemic gets better and I can travel, of course I would want to go back to LA, see all my childhood friends. And yes, see you, Laura. I miss you so much. And congratulations on your wedding. I'm so happy for you. I can't believe you're fucking married, but yay <laughs> to our minority college roommate. Yes. You can go back to the 10th episode to understand what that meant. And, uh, Abby Boson, what's the biggest eggplant and smallest eggplant you've ever encountered? Show the size. And in Korean, she wrote, <laughs> I'm dead. Oh my God. That deserves a sip of alcohol. Oh my God. Do I answer this question? <laughs> okay. I think the smallest. <laughs> <laughs> the smallest was the size of my palm. <laughs> oh my God. Must feel sorry for that man. Cause he knows he has to know. He has to know and live with that for the rest of his life. And the biggest. Hmm. 
oh, maybe like <laughs> this, this length from the tip of this cable mouth here to the top. <laughs> oh, you guys know how to keep it not so classy on my show. Man. All right. Uh, I feel like I have a little bit more. I'm actually going to try to answer a little bit more and then move on to the next segment. I decided I have segments today in my own mind. Okay. Kenneth C. Park 622. Have you ever received a DM, responded, and ended up meeting slash hooking up with them? No, never. <laughs> never. And I don't think I would. I don't think I would do that. Uh, Ruth J. Kim. Ruth Ani. Ruth is... One of the physical angels that showed up in my life that helped me get through the toughest time of my life. Um, yeah, and she knows that I, I love her to death. And she said, can you babysit Ava? Which is her, like her baby is the cutest like baby in the world. She, she should be a baby model. I think she would do really well. But yes, of course I could babysit Ava. Just let me know when. All right. I dot M underscore Nikki. What is your definition of happiness? P.S. Thank you for being so awesome. Love you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm assuming your name is Nikki. What is the definition of happiness? Hmm. That's a tough question because I don't know if I'm truly happy right now <laughs> because I'm always striving for something, you know, like I, I want to be places, I want to be doing things and it's not happening and it's actually a really stressful time for me in my life. But my happiness is mm, the people in my life that I really care about and that I know really care about me. Um, I think that's that's what happiness is, the people in your life. Because those people are the ones that will bring the joy, bring the smiles and the laughters um, and bring the realness that you need in order for you to be the best person that you can be. And that doesn't mean that it's like a shit ton of people. I only have, I can count on my fingers and toes, the close friends that I have that I can absolutely trust telling them everything to. And the older you get, you'll, you'll realize and understand you don't need to be friends with everybody. You don't need everybody to like you. That is impossible. And you do your best to be cordial and respectful to everyone around you, but you don't need them to like you and you don't need to like everybody else. And it's, it's really about the, the core people in your life that will do everything in their power to make you a better person and you would do the same for that person. That's what happiness is. Ha! Such deep talks on my show today. All right. September 5th, 915. Oh, again. Oh, curious about your past Halloween stories. I don't really do things for Halloween, so I don't really have any Halloween stories. Uh, e underscore Y I I Z Y. Yeezy. <laughs> Would you consider acting or are you strictly music? Maybe a musical. I actually grew up doing musicals. Uh, I played Pepper in Annie. Tomorrow, tomorrow. I love it. Yeah, I was Pepper. I was a bitch. Uh, yes, I love doing musicals. And if ever I, I was given a chance to do it, I would for sure do it. And I actually acted when I was younger a lot more than singing or dancing. So I did, I do still, I do still want to pursue a career in acting and Actually, this year, I wanted to spend some time in the States and pursue that side of my career, but the pandemic happened and nobody is acting in LA right now. So yeah, it just screwed up my year. But it is going to happen. Esna is going to be a huge movie star one day. All right. Mars Waffle. How do you feel knowing that your song puts smiles and bring joy to people all around the world? Oh, <laughs> these are such heartfelt messages. Thank you so much for them. Uh, I, I'm glad. It, I'm glad that my music is doing their job. <laughs> uh, the whole point of my music is I want people to feel things. 
you know, in a world where it's so cold and you don't, you you have to push things down or you have to put up a front or wear a different mask with different people. Like I want my music to be able to touch people's hearts and make you feel something, whether it be you can finally acknowledge the fact that you're angry at this man for doing something and fucking do something about it. Or someone that just needed to be comforted and know that there's someone out there that went through the same thing that um, understands you. Or songs that are just funny and that just make you laugh. Like, you know, ultimately, I just want to be able to make people feel something um, through the work that I put out. So if that's what my songs at this point in life is doing, then I'm glad. I'm happy. (laughs) I'm very happy knowing that. Amy, Amy Aliyah, she was on my show. You guys know she's one of my closest friends. Who was your favorite guest so far? And who did you least enjoy having on the show? Girl, are you trying to make me take a shot? (laughs) How can I answer that? I can't. I enjoyed having all of my guests on my show. (laughs) Oh, man. All right. I'm just going to have a drink to that because I can't specifically answer that question. (laughs) All right. Uh, Last one. And then I'm going to go on to the next segment of my show. Anti-stress routine. Uh, I don't think I have one. I don't have an anti-stress routine. I, when I'm stressed, all I do is eat, which is why it's impossible for me to lose weight. (laughs) <laughs> and get fit because <laughs> I work out enough I work out enough I just I eat like shit <laughs> and so you can see in my birthday body project I've basically given up on the eating part so now it's just a vlog of me working out and eating anything I want <laughs> um, yeah but I, I got I mean the last episode should have come out this week or next week so I didn't make it. I was supposed to lose 10 kilos <laughs> in six months. Yeah, two, six, eight, ten. No, in five months. Um, I lost two. <laughs> At least I lost something. Thinking positive. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So the next segment of my show is a random segment where I solve a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> So I'm going to give it to Albert Antonio. It's completely solved right now, but I'm going to give it to Albert Antonio and he's going to mix it up for me and I'm going to I'm going to fucking solve it. So I had never solved one in my life until a few months ago when on Netflix there was a documentary called The Speed Cubers. And I was like, "What is this documentary about fucking Rubik's Cube? Like how great can it be? Like how difficult can it be?" Well, I knew it was difficult because I've never been able to solve one in my life, but uh, I watched it and it was so good, so emotional. I recommended it to like all my friends. I literally cried watching it because it was so emotional. And knowing that the uh, the top um, world champion at one point was a Korean kid named Max Park. And, it, and the whole documentary revolves around Max Park and Felix. And at the end, after watching the documentary, I'm, I geeked the fuck out and I like DM'd Felix on Instagram. And I was like, I just watched the Netflix documentary. It was so moving, so emotional. And like, you guys are so cool. I'm like such a fan of you guys. Like, I really want to be able to solve a Rubik's Cube. And so I was like, hey, do you have like any recommendation, like recommendations for uh, a video on YouTube? Because he was like, you know, there's tutorials on YouTube. I was like, what is the best video you could recommend to me that I would be able to solve one? And he sent me a link and I learned. Um, So people can fucking solve this. (laughs) I can't multitask. (laughs) They can solve this in six seconds. So there's these championships um, that happen and people from all over the world will come and compete. And there are obviously different levels of Rubik's Cubes, like not, this is the most basic, the original three by three, but there are all these different shapes, uh, different numbers, and like it all becomes, comes down to the wire on the time, right? And so there's like this device where you put it down and then 
as soon as you take the hand off of it, it starts counting. So you're just like, f- f- like super fast. And then they, oh shit. <laughs> and then they put it down and it's like seven seconds, six seconds. Like it's fucking bizarre how fast they like use this, use their fingers to solve this. But the world champion is based on who can solve this the fastest. And so Max Park did that once. Felix holds a record. Recently, there was a video of Felix and this like, I don't know, 10 year old Asian kid. And this Asian kid was so fast, (laughs) moving their fingers like super, super fast. Um, But six seconds, five seconds, like that's fucking crazy. Did you ever think listening to my podcast, Esna would be solving a Rubik's Cube? No, but this is what I do. I am an entertainer in all aspects. (laughs) Listen, kids, what are you? <laughs> I wonder what my record is. And this is a stress reliever. I forgot who asked me the question, but this is my stress reliever. Figuring out a Rubik's Cube. This is my stress reliever, girl. Learn how to do a Rubik's Cube and it'll save your life. All right. Are you listening to this sh- 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 sound? It's so satisfying. All right, I did the bottom again. So now I'm gonna attempt doing the middle. I did it. The bottom two rows are done now. And so the the movements that I'm doing, it's like the righty alg and the lefty alg and the front face and it's like <laughs> rotation to the right and to the left. Like that's basically, I've memorized. I've memorized it. So now what I need to do is make sure that all the corners are corresponding to their respective colors. And I want to switch this and this. So one, two, three, right face. One, two, three. And then I switch it over and all of the corner pieces are on their respective. Yes. All right. So then I turn it around for the white on the bottom. Bam. Get the other white corner there. Bam. And all the corners are done. So I flip it back around, find a clear, a whole face that's done. We don't have one. So I'm just gonna make one. This is Righty algs, five. Lefty alg. And now there should be one that has one side of the face all done. So I use that facing me. (laughs) How stupid do I look right now? I solved the fucking Rubik's Cube. (laughs) How many of you guys can do that? I I don't think many. All right. I'm going to drink to that. All right. Okay. I don't remember who asked me, but I remember someone asking like, what songs do you like to cover? And so I'm going to sing a very short rendition of one of my favorite songs that I like to sing is Someone Like You by Adele. Let's see if I can do it. If I can't, I'm going to cut this out. <laughs> I heard that you settled down, that you found a girl and you're married now. I heard that your dream. Couldn't give to you Oh, friend Why so shy And I can To hold back Or hide from the light I hate to turn up But I blew uninvited But I couldn't stay away I couldn't fight it I hope to see my face That you'd be would you? And that you'd be reminded of me Never mind, I'll find someone like you I wish nothing but the best for you To Don't forget me, I beg I remember you said Sometimes you're less in life But sometimes 
sometimes it hurts instead. <웃음> 진짜 이거 라이브로 부르는 건 너무 부담스러워. <웃음> 와. 와. I haven't. Okay, so I sang this on a TV show. Uh, two years ago uh, and that's the last time I sang it and I wasn't playing the piano I was just sing, but playing the piano and singing oh my god this makes me like so jittery holy shit <laughs> okay. Uh, okay uh, I'm gonna sing a little bit more for you guys because uh, you know just in case people don't know I'm actually a singer <laughs> uh, this is my random notebook of like scribbles and scrabbles of sketches that I make of my songs I I haven't finished any of them. They're just in this notebook. <sighs> All right, maybe I'll sing this one just to... I've never sung a sketch for like the mass public to hear. So this is kind of the first time that this is happening, but... Oh. You're doing tonight. I just wanna be the one to be there when you get home. I don't wanna be the one whose hands you're gonna hold dead. Anytime we take a dread of places that we both know, can I be the place that you come? That is, I don't have a title for that song yet, <laughs> um, but I wrote this uh, about maybe eight, nine months ago. Still haven't been able to finish it, which means just complete it, like write new lyrics. Because when you're writing a song, when you have your verse and your chorus, you're basically done with the song in terms of melody, uh, because in a normal song format, that just repeats itself in the second half, right? So this melody, I would sing it again in the second half, right? And then you just make like a variation of the melody in your first verse, and then it becomes your second verse. And then the chorus needs to be simple enough that everybody remembers it so it becomes the same. And then all you have to do is come up with the middle eight, which is the bridge, and then make an intro, and make an outro and then you fucking have a song. And then the next step is to like fully produce it and arrange it so that, you know, it's like a bop and it's, it's a fucking hit. <laughs> uh, so this song is basically almost done, but I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just my completely lazy self or me just having to get out of this rut where I just really don't feel like my music career is going anywhere at this point. And so I kind of I kind of just like given hope and given up a little bit, but I do still want this. And so I, there are parts of me that still make like little songs and sketches here and there. And um, yeah, I had another one where it explains exactly that I just want to give up. And, and I remember after writing this, I'm like, why the fuck did I write such a hard melody? <laughs> um, Trying to understand where I am coming from Years and years of trying but it just is not enough I know all the things that I'd have to endure But nothing could prepare me for the things I'd face And this is just me like giving up. <laughs> uh, but of course I would never give up. I know that I, I'm going to believe that I have much more 
to accomplish in my life. Uh, but yeah, that was like the most um, live music I've done in a very, very long, long time. Yeah, I have so many sketches here. Oh man, maybe I'll sing you like a bunch of sketches and you guys tell me which one you like. Here, I have another one. <laughs> uh, you got me in the mood Like the lights that keep on changing And the way it makes me feel I can't say that I don't like it And then that's the that's the end of my sketch. <laughs> that's how raw it is. <laughs> I, just, I just write, I write. And then when I stuck, I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> and I never like finished it. And uh, this one is also, damn, I'm just like, I'm just giving y'all too much today. I'm just going to play you the piano because I think this riff is so pretty. the piano riff for that one not gonna sing for you <laughs> but yeah I think there were some people that are curious about like my writing process and how I write songs but this is kind of how it like I just like play around with chords and like um I'm very limited I'm not the best piano player out there honestly and I I'm very limited in the chord uh progression uh knowledge so you know, I just mess around and then I sing melodies into my head and then I normally write the lyrics as I write the music and as I go making the chord progressions. And God, I, th I think this was the last one that I wrote where I was having a hard time and I felt like giving up. And so I just wrote a song about that. And that's the last sketch that I made, um, which I just sing for you guys. A little while ago. Something interesting though, if you are stuck, it's interesting for you to play around with the bass note of your chord. So when when we think about a chord, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight and one are the same in an octave, right? One and eight is the octave. So if one is C, then this high C is an eight and everything in between. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, three, five make a major chord. Uh, but what I did with something like Someone Like You is I didn't start at the root of the chord, which is, this is the root, right? I heard that you're, right? And then settle down that you. This is, would be using, utilizing the root of the chord, but I used the third of the chord in the beginning. So this is in the key of G. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. But instead of using G as the main bass note that I use, I use the third note, which is B, which is the middle of the chord. And so that makes it very different from, right? So I used the three, the one, and then the five. And that makes it very pretty. And so then I use that for all the other progressions. And it makes it sound different. And then when I went into the second half of the verse, I started just using the, the root. And it makes it, well, this is the third, but everything else is in the root. And then it makes it sound more dramatic. Because this is this feels unresolved. Like it has to go somewhere. Back to the root it feels resolved right and then you continue yeah like there's a little music 101 going on on today's show today's show is really random but i really hope everyone's <laughs> enjoying it today was random uh we talked about why i'm single i justified it and explained it to everyone uh and i sang you guys the first song that i ever wrote in my life we talked about depression and overcoming that and then we solved a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> and then I sang you a bunch of random sketches that I've never finished. And I 
probably should. And then I sing you a song that I really like, but really badly. <laughs> uh, but I hope today's episode was entertaining for you guys. And happy birthday to me. <laughs> uh, thank you for always watching all of my episodes. And thanks for being not so classy with Esna. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Happy birthday to me. Bye. <laughs> Hey,